Hello everyone. As you probably gathered from the email I sent out to you, um, I am homesick today. Normally I lecture for four hours or do two sections of, uh, of two hour courses on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I know given the way that I feel there's no way I'll be able to make it through four hours of lecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post a couple of online lectures for both sections of the class um, that focus on population genetics. And so here is what I'd like for you to do. Review all of the online lectures I post today. Look in your chapter, uh, excuse me, in your textbook at chapter 25, Evolutionary Processes, and make sure that you read that chapter and focus particularly on pages 4 through 35 through 440. <clears throat> I also want you to grab out your sickle cell computer exercise packet. So remember at the beginning of the semester, you picked up from the bookstore um, a packet of computer exercises. One of them was the Darwinian snails exercise, and the other one was the sickle cell exercise. And I said that we would be getting back to that sickle cell exercise. Well, we're getting back to it now. So what I want you to do is to read at least the introduction to that sickle cell computer exercise. So this is what's going to happen on Thursday, and on Thursday when you come in, I'll ask if there are questions and review any questions um, on the material presented in these online lectures or from the pages in your textbook I just indicated. I will give you a quiz on the material in these online lectures and uh, the material in your textbook, as well as the introduction to the sickle cell computer exercise. I will... Um, then allow you guys to get started on that sickle cell computer exercise in class. And remember, you're going to be using that same software, that SimBio software, to complete this computer exercise. So on Thursday, what you will need to do is, um, if you like, we will have some computers in class, but, but if you would like, um, bring your own computer um, with that uh, software downloaded. You should have it still on your computer from the Darwinian Snails exercise and we'll do the sickle cell exercise. <clears throat> okay, so let's get, oh, one other thing. Um, you have also probably noticed that uh, the exa second exams uh, have been graded and your grades are posted up on Blackboard. Um, on Thursday, I will give you the exams back and I will also give you a little sheet of paper that um, tells you where you stand in the class um, at the moment. If you are anxious about this and you would like to know where you stand before Thursday, I will check my email regularly and can get back to you about your standing in the class before Thursday if you like. So feel free to email me. I understand that some of you may be anxious given that the withdrawal date is Friday, April 12th. That is this Friday. <clears throat> okay, now let's get started. Um, remember, up to this point, we've been talking about evolution in very general terms. So evolution is um, descent with modification, or evolution is a change in a population over time. And we're now, because we know a lot more about um, meiosis and Mendelian genetics, we're now able to refine our definition a bit. So we can now talk about evolution as a change in a population's heritable characteristics or allele frequencies over time. This component here, allele frequencies, is particularly important. Okay, Remember, we during our paper discussion last week, we talked about the fact that, the, that when uh, the allele frequencies in a population change over time, we know that evolution has occurred. Okay, And we um, are not sure what might have caused those allele frequencies to change, but we do know that evolution has occurred in the population. <clears throat> so we're going to talk now about, um, about the field of population genetics and how it is that we can determine that allele frequencies have changed over time and what are the possible mechanisms that have led to those changes in, in allele frequencies. We first have to define a population, and a population is a group of interbreeding individuals and their offspring. So if you were to look at this field of snapdragons, we would say that this 
field of snapdragons represents a group of potentially interbreeding individuals and their eventual offspring. Okay, this is a population of organisms. <coughs> Excuse me. We know that adults produce gametes, that gametes combine to make zygotes, that zygotes develop into individuals, uh, particularly juveniles, and those juveniles grow up to be the next generation of adults. In population genetics, what we're interested in is will particular alleles or genotypes become more or less common in a population over time and why? So let's imagine that we're interested in studying this, pic this uh, population of snapdragons. <clears throat> And I'm going to ask you guys to bear with me. I'm going to use a new drawing tool, and so hopefully it won't be too clumsy here. So we're, we're interested in, in studying um, this population of snapdragons, and we're interested in whether uh, allele frequencies in this population are going to change over time. Okay. Let's assume that we are studying a particular gene. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so let's call it the A gene. Okay, this is the gene we're going to study. And we know that there are two alleles for this gene in this population. There's a big A allele and there's a little A allele. In this population of breeding adults, we've actually looked at all of the, pol uh, of the sperm and egg cells in this population. And we know that 60% of the gametes amongst adults in this population possess the big A allele, and 40% of the gametes in this population possess the little A allele. Okay? Or the frequency of the big A allele in the gametes of this population is 0.6 and the frequency of the little a allele in the gametes of this population is 0 0.4. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to look at this population of gametes. Okay, so here is the population of gametes. You have big a alleles in some, which you can see here, and little a alleles in others. Okay, this is your gene pool. Let's assume that this population is very large and that the gametes will fuse with one another at random. In other words, there's random mating. If there is no change in this population, in other words, if there is no natural selection, if there's complete random mating in this population, if there is no immigration, that is individuals coming into the population, or Im immigration, individuals leaving the population, what we can do is we can predict what the uh, next, um, what the allele frequencies will be in the next generation of these snapdragons using a Punnett square. And again, knowing that 60% of all the gametes possess the big A allele and 40% of all the gametes possess the little A allele. So let's look at the Punnett square here. Now listen, when we're talking about Punnett squares here, we're using the Punnett square to um, predict what the allele frequencies will be in the next generation if no change occurs in this population. So instead of having individuals with a particular genotype producing particular alleles, we have um, the frequency of particular alleles amongst all the gametes of the population, in this, in this case the eggs of this population, in all of the eggs of this population, 60% or 0.6 um, have the big A allele, and 40% or 0.4 have the little A allele. In the sperm cells of this population, it's exactly the same. 60% uh, or 0.6 will possess the big A allele, and 40% or 0.4 will possess the little A allele. Given the frequencies of these gamete genotypes, we can predict what the genotypes are going to be in 
the next generation if no change occurs in this population. In other words, if no evolution occurs in this population. Okay, The frequency of individuals that are homozygous dominant will be 0 0.36. That is 0 0.6 times 0 0.6 equals 0 0.36 um, uh, of the individuals will have will be homozygous dominant. 0.24 or 24 percent of the individuals will receive a big A allele from this from a sperm cell and a little A allele from the egg cell. That is 0.4 times 0.6 is 0 0.24. 24 percent are 0.24 uh, are at a frequency of 0.24 individuals will receive a little A allele from a sperm from a sperm cell and a big A allele from an egg cell or again 0.6 times 0.4 and 0.16 or 16 percent of the individuals in the next population in the next generation will be homozygous recessive that is 0.4 times 0.4 okay so <clears throat> essentially what we have done is to say that 0.3 36% of the individuals in the next generation um, of this, in this population will be homozygous dominant, 0.48% will be heterozygous, and, uh, or excuse me, 48% will be heterozygous, and 16% will be homozygous recessive. And if you add these totals up, 0.36 plus 0.48 plus 0.16, that equals 1. So what we have done here is we have essentially um, derived the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation using a simple Punnett square. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. So what we're going to say is that um, the frequency of the big A allele is equal to P, okay, and the frequency of the little a allele in the population is equal to Q, okay. And we know that the frequency of the little a allele plus the frequency of the big A allele has to equal 1. So P plus Q has to equal 1. In this case, 0 0.6 plus 0 0.4 equals 1. Okay? So we know that P plus Q equals 1. <clears throat> we also know that um, P times P, in this case, 0 0.6 times 0 0.6, or p squared is the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals. Remember this is 0 0.36 okay? or 0 0.6 squared, right? We know that um, Q times Q or Q squared equals the frequency, excuse me, of homozygous recessive individuals. In this case, Q is equal to 0 0.4 squared equals 0 0.16. Okay, so P squared is a frequency of homozygous dominant individuals. Q squared is the frequency of homozygous recessive individuals. We also know that 2 times P times Q is equal to the frequency, excuse me, <clears throat> of heterozygous individuals or 2 times 0 0.6 times 0 0.4 equals 1. 
times 0 0.4 equals 0 0.48. That is the frequency of heterozygous individuals. Okay. And if we take all of these numbers, p squared plus 2pq plus q squared, they should add up to 1. So the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals is 0 0.36 plus the frequency of heterozygotes, 0 0.48 plus the frequency of homozygous recessive individuals, 0 0.16 is equal to 1. These are the two components of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation here. And also, another component of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation is P plus Q equals 1. Okay. So we've pretty much, <coughs> excuse me, we've pretty much derived the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation by using a Punnett square. Okay. So review this. Two important things to remember about the Hardy-Weinberg principle. That is P and Q are allele frequencies and P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared are genotype frequencies. Okay? There's a difference between these two. Let's look at another example to sort of clarify our ideas here. And this example comes straight out of your textbook. This is on page 437 of your text. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's assume that we are looking at two alleles for a particular gene. Let's call this the A gene again. In this case, we're not going to um, call the alleles for this gene big A and little a. We'll call them A1 and A2. Okay, there are different ways to depict symbols for alleles in populations. Let's assume that P is equal to the frequency of the A1 alleles in the gene pool of the population and Q is equal to the frequency of the A2 alleles in the, um, in the, in the population or in the gene pool. Let's suppose that the initial frequency of the A1 allele which we've designated as P, is 0 0.7. The first thing we have to do in working through the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation is to determine what would Q be. <clears throat> and remember, we know that P plus Q is equal to 1, right? So if we know that P is equal to 0 0.7, 0 0.7 plus Q is equal to 1, then Q is equal to 1 minus 0 0.7, or Q is equal to 0 0.3. Okay, so we can determine now we now know that the frequency of the A1 allele, which we're designating as P is 0 0.7 and the frequency of the A2 allele in this population or Q is equal to 0 0.3. Okay, That's the first thing we have to figure out in this population. Okay, Now let's try to figure out the genotypes that would be present in this population if nothing is impacting it, if nothing is causing um, evolution to occur. So we've already determined what Q is here, which is 0 0.3. Our next question is how many different genotypes are possible in this population? And we can do a Punnett square as we did in the previous example to figure this out. So the frequency in the eggs the frequency of the A1 allele in, egg set, in the egg cells is 0 0.7. The frequency of the uh, A2 allele in the egg cells is 0 0.3. We've already determined that. And the same is true of the sperm cells. A1 is 0 0.7. A2 is 0 0.3. There are a couple of different possible genotypes in the next generation of this population. 
There are individuals that are A1, A1. There are individuals that are A1, A2, that is, they got an A1 allele from a sperm cell and an A2 allele from an egg cell. A1, A2, in this case, they got uh, the A1 allele from the egg cell and the A2 allele from the sperm cell. And A2, A2. Okay, these are our genotypes, our potential genotypes. Their frequencies would be 0.7 times 0.7 or 0.7 squared, which is 0 0.49 for, for A1, A1 individuals. It would, for A2, A2 individuals, it's 0.3 times 0.3 or 0.3 squared, which is equal to 0 0.09. And for heterozygous individuals, it's 2 times PQ, 2 times 0.7 times 0.3, okay, which is equal to 0 0.42 or 0.21 plus 0.21. Okay, so what we've determined is that each of these uh, different genotype frequencies are easily determined using the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation. And because there has been no evolution or nothing impacting the allele frequencies of this population, the allele frequencies of A1 and A2 should be the same. It should be 0.7 and 0.3. In other words, their frequencies have not changed. And you can determine this uh, if by looking even at the genotype frequencies, you can then derive the allele frequencies. So in other words, <clears throat> if the genotype frequency is p squared, if the genotype frequency for A1 and A1, A1, A1 is p squared, then p is equal to 0 0.75, or, excuse me, 0 0.70 or the square root of 0 0.49. We can determine the frequency of the A2 allele in the same way. We know that the frequency of A2, A2 individuals, which is Q squared equals 0 0.09, in order to determine the uh, A2 allele frequency, all we have to do is take the square root of 0 0.09, which is 0 0.330, to determine the frequency of the A2 allele. Okay, It's essentially <clears throat> explaining what Allele and genotype frequencies will be in a population if no change occurs in that population over time. Okay. Here's what I want us to do. Let's work through um, a couple of little problems here. <clears throat> and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the, um, the YouTube video at this point and restart it um, with uh, this problem in the next YouTube video. So I'll see you in just a sec.